Anyway, welcome to you all to this, uh, what I've just discovered is the 10th Julian Tudor Hart lecture. Um, the Julian Tudor Hart lectures were set up by a rag bag of academics and public health practitioners um, at Julian's suggestion uh, in order to examine some of the key issues that are important to us, both in terms of um, health, primary care, public health, and other aspects of the healthcare system, uh, and also in terms of politics, because as you all know, Julian Tudor Hart is uh, an unashamedly uh, political person who recognizes that the good science that people do in universities has to be connected to the politics of the wider world. And that's what these lectures have been set up in order to um, promote and promulgate and celebrate uh, in different ways. Um, it's the 10th lecture, as I've said. Uh, and tonight, we're delighted to be able to welcome um, Professor Danny Dawling, who is um, the Halford Mackinder Professor of Geography at the University of Oxford. Um, prior to moving to Oxford in 2013, he taught at both the universities of Sheffield and Leeds. So he's gone from the sublime to the ridiculous, you might say. Um, I'd like to be able to say to the, tonight that um, this is a great night for Wales. And it is a great night for Wales, because uh, although the football went the wrong way yesterday, I think that we feel um, very proud that our small country could have done, done so well. Um, and in any event, if we had one, there probably wouldn't be anybody here this evening, Dan, to <laughs> come and listen to you. So in many ways, it's a, it's a mixed blessing. So Danny is uh, not only an academic at the University of Oxford, but he is genuinely one of our public intellectuals. He speaks powerfully and with conviction about a number of issues. Health is very important in his work, but also housing, uh, the benefit system, uh, and he speaks very clearly about these things, but with a sense of authority that comes from a deep commitment to understanding the world. Uh, he doesn't just stand on a soapbox, although he does that very well. And he brings to his uh, speaking uh, a sense that he has thought long and hard about these things. And tonight he's going to talk about politics. You might feel that we've had enough, <laughs> we've had enough politics over the last uh, few weeks and months, but I'm sure Danny will bring uh, a fresh perspective to uh, our understanding, and he's going to talk about a better politics uh, and about how government can make us happier and healthier. So without taking any more of his time, uh, can I welcome Danny? Uh, he's going to speak for about 45 minutes. We'll then have time for questions and discussion. Uh, and my colleague Ian Rees Jones will be saying a few words at the end about the future of the lecture series uh, and one or two other issues, I'm sure. So, Danny, welcome to Cardiff, and we look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Almost seamless. Uh, thank you ever so much for that, and thank you uh, for inviting me. I really will uh, just take about 45 minutes, maybe a little bit less, because I'm 
most interested in what you have to say to me and what you have to ask me. I wrote a book last year called A Better Politics, How Government Can Make Us Happier and Healthier. That's why this is the title of the lecture. And obviously a lot has changed in the last year and in the last few weeks. What I wanted to try to do... Sorry, can you speak into the mic? Is that better for you? Yes. What I wanted to try to do uh, was to say, what would a government do if it actually looked at what most matters to people, rather than what the government think matters to itself, or rather than what people often say matters to them, what actually matters most to people. And to do that, I didn't look at what people say when they campaign and they tell you what the population want or what the population need. I looked at a survey. Uh, this picture was taken by a friend, a friend of mine, I think in the Cotswolds in September 2015. I, I like the way that the sun shines off the man's head uh, in the picture. I'm slightly more worried about the little girl in the corner looking somewhat concerned about what was going on back then. And I will talk about this towards the end of the lecture if you're wondering if I'm going to get to it. Um, but before we get there, I want you to consider two questions. These are two questions which were asked in the British Household Panel Study in the 1990s. The first question was asked at the very end of the survey, a survey of about 10,000 people. It was asked in four years in a row, and the question is, state in your own words what in the last year has happened to you or your family which has stood out as important. And people could write in up to four answers. So I'd just like you to think, I won't ask you to say, but if you were filling in this question, what has happened in the last year to you or your family that has stood out as important, what would you put down? And the second question that I was interested in is a question about happiness. And it's a very British question about happiness. Uh, the question wording is, have you recently been feeling reasonably happy, all things considered? <laughs> Um, and you're only allowed to have three answers. You've each got to think of a number. And your number is, no, I've generally been feeling less than reasonably happy, then you are one, two, I felt the same as usual, and three, actually, I felt more than reasonably happy. And what I and my colleague Demetrius Ballas did, uh, who's currently working on the University of Aegean on Lesbos in Greece, what me and Demetrius did is try to predict people's happiness levels from the things that had happened to them in the last year. <coughs> because if you're worried about what the population might need or what you might want politicians to do, then the things which most make people happy are probably things it's worth trying to encourage and support, and the things which cause the most misery are the things you want to avoid. Um, now, you may be able to guess what they are. The minute I show you the answers, they become rather obvious, I think, and you think, why, the, why on earth did you need to do that? So just try and have a think what the things are that are most associated with making people less happy, and I'll show you what they are in just two seconds. So here are the events most strongly related to you becoming less happy. Um, they are your relationship ending. But then, after that, it is experiencing the death of a parent in the last year, your parents' health being poor in the last year, somebody else dying. Now, these are all pretty rare events. Most of us only have two parents. If you're adopted, you're lucky you might have more. But the effects of our health and other people's health on us is stunning in terms of what actually matters. Now, if you... Sorry, can you go back into the mic? Okay. If you... Um, the older you are, the more you'll know this is true, on average. And if you're young and know it's true, you've been a bit unlucky. And if you're old and don't know this is true, you've been lucky. But health really is one of the most important uh, factors for well-being. So what a government needs to do is worry about health above almost everything else 
and not do things which lead to people being more likely to split up from each other because of the importance of relationships. I won't go through the other factors, some of them are quite amusing. Uh, education tends to be associated with, with unhappiness when you're talking about your children's education <coughs> and how they're doing at school. It tends to be associated with happiness when you're talking about your own education. Uh, holidays, family holiday is neutral. It doesn't actually make people <laughs> happier. You can, you can save a lot of money uh, on that. And here are the things associated with greater happiness. Starting a relationship, um, but gaining a job. Not being promoted, getting one from being unemployed. Being able to get a mortgage, some security for your house. Uh, and then pregnancy, birth. There's a wonderful balancing in, in all of these things. They kind of ev even themselves up. Um, and in a way, they have to. The average happiness level is people are on average 25% happier than average. Right? We don't on average tick the, we're the same. We tend to tick we're happier more often than we tick we're less happy because human beings are optimistic. Happiness is associated with new relationships and forming relationships. Uh, the best people at recording births are grandparents. It might be that not so much happens uh, in old age and it's quite an event becoming a grandparent, but there are huge differences between people. Women are three times more likely to record becoming a parent than men are. It's absolutely staggering the number of men who forget that they became a father <laughs> uh, in, in the last 12 months. Um, but you get an idea of you know, the things that matter in life are the really basic things. Not about getting rich, not about getting more money, not exotic holidays, not spending a load, not going out. Nobody wrote down on the form, I was worried about terrorism. The least significant event, there are only 32 things that actually happen to you uh, in life. You may think there's more, but when you look at 10,000 people, you find it's 32. The least significant event is passing your driving test. It tends to make people a little bit happier. Um, so I started off with those and said, so given that, given that this is actually what is most important to people, when you look at what makes them less happy and more happy, how can government worry about these things? And what would, and I call it a carer, kinder, maybe cleverer politics, be like if it thought that this was the most important set of things to be concerned with? And that's the book. Well, if you just take things like people's happiness at the fact that they managed to get themselves a mortgage, what's all that about? A mortgage is actually a giant debt. It's an enormous amount of money you're going to have to pay back with interest to somebody else. The reason we're happy if we can get a mortgage, and this was way back in the 90s when this survey was done, is because of the insecurity of renting, particularly private renting. This graph, I won't describe all these because I won't get through in 45 minutes if I do that, but this graph is showing the return of the private renting generation. Most people rented privately 100 years ago, 80 years ago. That went away. That's coming back again, particularly in the south of England. I have lots and lots of references to studies done by economists and other people. There's a whole set of happiness economists now who find that people are happier, and this is genuinely happier rather than superficially happier. Superficial happiness is when I ask you how happy you are from a scale from 1 to 10, and you will answer 7 because that is how people in this country tend to answer that question. If you were in the United States, you'd be more likely to answer eight. If you were in France, you'd head down towards five, um, which is a much more sensible answer to give on a scale from one to 10, if you, if you think about it. These studies actually look at a, a series of questions about do you have problems sleeping at night, do you worry about the future, those kind of things, and find that people in much more equitable countries, particularly the Scandinavian countries, manage to sleep at night a lot better than people in the United States of America, which is hardly surprising when you begin to look at what actually happens in the United States of America to people as opposed to what happens in more equal countries. But we can just look within Europe to see enormous differences in how we behave. Uh, this graph is showing you data from the International Monetary Fund 
about the proportion of national income spent on public spending, which is roughly the same as the amount which is taken in taxation. And there are enormous differences. You're often told that there is no alternative, we have to tax less and spend less because there's a race to the bottom. Um, whoever tells you that is either incredibly ignorant or very good at lying, because the data clearly shows you that you can tax and spend 57% of income and be like Finland if you want to have the best schools in the world, or you can be like France or Denmark or Germany or practically anywhere else in Europe, or you can be like us in Ireland and be on that race to the bottom of taxing and spending less than any other country. Ireland, by the way, that huge increase in spending in the middle of Ireland was because the Irish followed our advice about guaranteeing every last deposit in their banks. Um, possibly the worst financial advice ever given in the history of the world. Uh, and we gave them a little loan to encourage them to do it as well. Uh, because Julian's here, I thought I'd stick this slide in. There is lots of good news in, in these kind of surveys, and we often miss out the good news. Uh, one of the many things that Julian did is, is discover and report on the inverse care law, which is in health services, particularly privatised ones, but in general, the more that there is need in an area for health care, the less that tends to be provided. If you look at the distribution of doctors, you'll find that doctors still are found in higher numbers in areas where the population is more healthy, whereas you'd have thought you'd have doctors in higher numbers in areas where they were needed. What this graph is actually showing you is that people who provide care for free for members of their families or friends, not always their families, and they do so in almost direct proportion to the need, to the level of illness in those areas. Most people are pro-social. Most people uh, have a strong sense of emotion and empathy and feeling for other people. A few people don't, um, but most do. I should say, by the way, that the cartoons are by Ella, Ella Furness, who's a PhD student here who very kindly uh, drew all the cartoons to the book to try to make it a little bit lighter than it would ever otherwise be. Uh, you may have seen these maps in the last week or so. Uh, they're made by my colleague Ben Hennig, and they're showing you the distribution of the, of the vote in the referendum of those who voted, um, and showing you that it was London, Scotland, Oxford, Cambridge, Cardiff, Liverpool, Norwich, who a majority uh, remain. Much of the rest of the country, very narrow majority leave. Uh, but what's often forgotten when you look at this particular distribution of the vote, is that the majority of people who voted to leave lived in the south of England. 52% of leave voters lived in London, the south east, the south west, the eastern region and the east midlands. Mainly because that's where the bulk of the population live. 53% of people in my region, the south east of England, voted uh, to leave. 59% of leave voters were middle class, A, B or C1 because two-thirds of everybody who voted was middle class in the referendum. There's been a demonisation of northern council estates, which, to be honest, it doesn't matter how people voted on northern council estates. There are too few people on northern council estates to actually have swung things. And the turnout was incredibly low on northern council estates. Turnout is also low for the young. Uh, but that's hardly surprising because turnout for the young has been getting lower and lower at general election after general election after general election. Not unrelated to the fact that we have been teaching young people since just after I stopped being young that what matters is how you look after yourself, how you behave for yourself, how you take your exams. Don't worry about society because there is no such thing as society. Just work hard yourself and then you expect them to come out and vote in what essentially is a religious practice because your individual vote will almost never matter. I, th I don't think we should blame the young for not voting um, because we created a society in which the young became less and less likely to vote. There's the figures if you're interested in the geography of the uh, Referendum. The referendum is very, very interesting because nobody predicted it. 
Hardly anybody predicted the result of the general election last May, but nobody predicted this. The spread betting people tend to get the predictions right, they didn't this time. The money markets tend to have a fairly good idea, they were completely out this time. Not a single author wrote the very short book on what happens next, which if it had gone in the bookshops the day after would have made an absolute fortune. <laughs> Nobody wrote an article in any magazine or newspaper predicting this. It, it is very, very, uh, very interesting to look at. And for me, the key thing is there are Leave voters everywhere. There are Leave voters in my hometown of, of Oxford. Uh, when I used to work at the University of Sheffield, we used to do a fair for our undergraduates at the start of, I think, every second year when we put all the information about the courses they could choose out. And one year, one course hadn't been arranged, and so the course was just called To Be Arranged. More undergraduates chose To Be Arranged <laughs> <laughs> than anything else we were offering. And um, I, I do feel, I do think, that in hindsight, we'll get the election study results in September, we'll be able to check this. In hindsight, I think, that people voted in large numbers for anything other than this because of what the United Kingdom was slowly becoming, which is a place full of losers in a society which divides people by winners and losers. And the losers are everywhere. The losers are in the southeast of England. The losers are in Oxfordshire. The losers are not who you think the losers are. Uh, I published an editorial in the British Medical Journal today about the vote, but also about the, the rise in deaths in this country. Last year there was a 9% increase in mortality in Britain. Life expectancy has been falling in many areas. 9% is enormous. The last time we had a 9% increase in mortality was in the first year of the Second World War. You have to go back to the cholera epidemics of 1846 to find similar events. Absolutely enormous increases in death in, in the United Kingdom. And these increases are found everywhere. They're found in isolated rural areas where elderly people have stopped receiving their visits from social workers, or even the person who turns up for 15 minutes once a week where the rural bus services have been cut, where the Mills and Wheels have gone. The UK has become a worse and worse country for many, many people, many of whom are classified as doing quite well, as it divides and as it splits up. The rise in deaths that occurred last year, and it wasn't because of the flu, by the way. Uh, we've, we've worked that one out. The rise happened over many, many months. Flu epidemics happened over about four weeks. Uh, the biggest increasing causes of death put down were Alzheimer's and dementia, but you don't suddenly get a one-year epidemic of Alzheimer's and dementia. It's people with Alzheimer's and dementia dying. It was a frail dying. It was people in care homes dying faster, often dehydrated. Not unrelated to the fact that the people who worked in the care home were having to do another job working during the day because they were having to pay for the bedroom tax on the house that they were living in. You can begin to wrap all of this up. The increase was biggest for the over 90s, 12% rise, 10% rise for people aged 85, 7% for 84, and so on. It's the same age profile as Harold Shipman <coughs> targeted, except it's 100 times more deaths than Harold Shipman, and over 100 times less reported in our newspapers. Um, and that's quite stunning. What kind of a country can you live in which has its biggest increase in mortality since the war and nobody notices or appears to care too much because, well, it's a cost saving, isn't it? If they die a bit earlier, it won't cost us quite as much. I will try to <coughs> make you a bit happier later, but you cannot, <laughs> you, you cannot talk about what is probably the most serious health event in not just my lifetime, but in my parents' lifetime and not say that something is badly wrong with the UK. David Cameron will be the first Prime Minister I know to leave office with life expectancy falling. That's his legacy. 
that is quite hard to, to achieve. This graph appeared in the Social Mobility Commission's report a few years ago, showing the massive increases in families with children having to rent privately in the country. So we've had so much evidence that things have been getting worse that we've just acclimatised to. We've become used to it. Um, you can be evicted with two months' notice. Your children have to find a new school, or you have to find a new school for them, they have to find new friends. This is happening in London, uh, on average, more than once every three years to families now. More families of children in private rented in London suddenly than in social housing. You begin to get lots of graphs like this. This is the graph of the crisis in the United States and how unequal the United States got a few years ago when 40% of the population only had that fraction of the wealth. The data's a bit old because it got worse after that and 40% of the population had negative wealth because some of them had tried to buy some houses and they got negative equity and 40% were in the sea. So it's not just us. The United States is a more unequal country than us. But in Europe, we are the most unequal country economically. I've been showing this graphic for the last three or four years about trouble ahead. I didn't think the trouble ahead would come this way, but this is the way we're going to, we are getting the trouble ahead uh, now. A generation with precarious employment, with debts that they cannot repay, with no offer of, sec of secure housing. It isn't a normal way to run a set of four countries. It's not all bad. More people have gone to university than ever before, are being treated ever better than ever before, have a sense of their self-worth, which is greater than ever before, but somehow we've allowed the inequalities to rise and rise. Somehow, partly by accident, we allowed landlords to make £434 billion pounds worth of profit in the aftermath of the financial crash because people couldn't get mortgages, so they had to rent, rent went up, landlords bought houses, the value of the housing went up, the landlords used the increased rent to buy another house, and on and on, and people who sold their right to buy houses to landlords, who then charged people far higher rent, and 434 billion. The figure revealed by the estate agent Savills, the estate agent to the rich, and published in the Financial Times. Right. What is remarkable now, is that very establishment parts of societies are worried about what has been going on and how fast it has been going on. This graph is a graph of data which was released by the Office of National Statistics and then they withdrew it on the distribution of wealth in the country. It shows you that the 1% have the majority of wealth. They withdrew it because they couldn't be sure it's correct because they were worried that it was an underestimate of the wealth. By the way, this has suddenly got much better. Um, we have had the most rapid reduction in wealth inequality I have ever seen in the last two weeks. Boris Johnson has achieved more than any Labour minister <laughs> ever managed to reduce the gap between the poor and the rich in this country. The value of stocks and shares and investments and private pensions has gone down internally. The value of homes in Notting Hill they are desperately trying to put out stories saying that Chinese investors are flooding in. Not a single Chinese investor has yet arrived. The stories about the Chinese investors, um, of which there are now many in the newspapers, are planted by estate agents and other people involved in the property business in London because they are desperate for overseas, overseas buyers to come in and buy, so they keep their jobs. When the property market collapsed in 2008-9, the majority of estate agents lost their jobs because they rely on turnover <coughs> in the market. The good news, the Office of National Statistics, looking at their Wealth and Assets survey, uh, found out that actually owning a lot of property wealth and a high pension doesn't tend to make you happier. Small amounts of savings are associated with greater happiness. Just a little bit of a feeling of security is associated with greater happiness. Uh, so those people in Notting Hill who've suddenly become a lot poorer needn't worry about it too much for the long term. They were not actually that happy behind those posh Georgian front doors in the, in the first place. 
the worry, the worry is that we're going to return to this world. This is a picture of a uh, plaque you can see up at Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire showing the inequality in the pay of servants in the palace a century ago. Um, the worry is that Plan A works, the overseas investors come in and buy up London, and we become a kind of Singapore of the West, and there are jobs for our children as servants in future in this offshore country. I really don't think that's going to happen, um, but that is worth worrying about. There was evidence two, three years ago that life expectancy began falling, first of all for elderly women, because elderly women are so much more likely to be on their own than elderly men. The graph is showing the cuts in, in home visits that occurred with austerity. We're getting more and more evidence. Incredible correlations with pension credit cuts and increased death rates were published in, in journals in last year. The figure there says 5% in England and Wales because that was the number we knew in February of this year. ONS released on schedule, it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't a conspiracy, but ONS released these worst ever figures on health on the 23rd of June, <coughs> which partly explains why nobody reported them, because we were thinking about something else on the 23rd of June, and then we've been thinking about a lot of other things things since, and today we're thinking about Chilcot. You can't get, well I've been trying to work out just how many people would have had to die to manage to get onto page four or five of a national newspaper. It hasn't yet been reported, it will be reported at some point. Um, as you can see I have far too many graphics of this kind. Um, I'm just trying to get home, we really are a dramatically unequal country when it comes to income, the best of 10% of people take 28% of all income. No other country in Europe is as unequal as that. Why do they do it? I'm part of it, I'm in the best of 10%. Because the part I'm in, which is the bottom 90% of the best of 10%, we only take half of that. The 1% are taking 14%, we're taking 14%. We take around 10 times less than the 1%, so we don't think we're taking too much, and I only need my salary to buy a house which is partly why the house prices went up and up and up. Did the 1% feel happy? No, because there's more inequality within the 1% than there is in the other 99%. You can be at the bottom of the 1%, that means you've got an income, household income of about £200,000 in London, and you cannot buy a free bed family house in Fulham without some help from mum and dad. And you are in the 1%. How on earth did we get into this mess? What levels of greed did it take to, to end up where we, where we are? We're learning lots of things. We're learning that people live shorter lives in more unequal countries. This is a relationship between wealth and life expectancy. Japan is the most equitable of the rich countries. It didn't used to be. In the 1930s, it was one of the most unequal of the rich countries, and it had one of the lowest life expectancies. This has nothing to do with diet. It has everything to do with a change in Japanese society as a result of losing the war. This graph was produced by an obscure researcher about five years ago called Thomas Piketty um, and his colleagues. And it's showing the change in the top rate of income tax over about 40 years and the growth of the take of the 1%. And the two extreme countries are the United States and the United Kingdom, which both reduced top rates of taxes by around about 40-50% and saw the 1% taking more and more of what was left over time. High marginal tax rates, which in Europe are about 53, 54%, not much higher than our 45%, high marginal tax rates are not designed to raise taxes. High marginal tax rates are designed to stop people being greedy when they already get a lot of money and to stop firms being stupid and paying a few people a lot and everybody else less. Let's just take one example, take Barclays Bank. If you have low marginal taxes, then you can pay a few traders six million pounds a year or two million pounds a year, and you pay your blank bank clerks incredibly lowly because they don't matter. As soon as marginal tax rates go up, you're just wasting money paying people a high amount of money 
and so you don't do it. We have well over 2,000, well we had, some of them have gone to Paris, over, <laughs> well over 2,000 people paid over a million euros a year in our financial sector. The next highest number in Europe was 197 in Germany. It's gone down. The number of highly paid bankers in the whole of Europe has gone down by more than our highly paid bankers has gone up in the last two years. Bankers often say that you have to pay them this much or they'll go somewhere else to work. They have nowhere to go because nobody else pays that much apart from New York, which is now sitting very pretty. This was the IFS distribution of what the effects of benefit cuts and austerity were going to be, and it turned out to be what the effects of cuts and austerity were. It hit people on the bottom of society more. And this is a graphic about the student debt bubble in the United States. It's, I, I kind of don't mind um, student debt because if you're trying to galvanise an entire generation of young people to do something different to their parents, giving them an almighty debt, which almost all of them will not be able to repay, if you get a good job, you've got to pay back over £100,000, and then giving them statements every year telling them how much they owe, which we're just beginning to do now, by 2020 we'll have eight years' worth of students. Half of all young women in England go to university. It's no longer an elite thing. Doing this to a young generation is going to make them angry. And it's a far better way to become angry than being sent to a war by your parents who didn't learn from the First World War to avoid the Second World War. It may sound fairly callous, but I hope that the student debt effect actually leads to people beginning to work out this doesn't work. You cannot run a model like this. We have to worry about who is most affected, who is most affected is women, poor women and children. There are numerous, numerous, numerous statistics about who's lost out the most. And in case you doubted me, I, I tend to think almost everybody knows this now. Everywhere was unequal. Everywhere became more unequal from around about 1913, which was the peak of inequality in the world through to the 1970s and then different countries went in different directions. Sometimes you're told that inequality has risen everywhere, which is another one of those, they're either very stupid or they're lying. It rose in the United States and it rose in the United Kingdom. That's the Netherlands. And most recently we've seen falls in inequality in most countries of the world, just not here. The UK did a remarkable thing. It went from being the second most equal country in the 1970s, large country to Sweden, to becoming the most unequal. We have gone through an amazing change since we actually joined the European Economic Area. Not because of Europe. Europe didn't tell us we had to do this. The other countries in Europe didn't do this, but we did it. And I do think but we need a lot more work on this, and we haven't had very long. I do think the phrase, take back control, resonates, because it says something's wrong, and something's certainly wrong. It's very simple to tell people it's fear of migration. I'll show you a, a graph later to, sh to show you why. I can go on and on about why it's not migration. Um, but the phrase was effective. Remain one in the places with the highest number of winners or the young who are optimistic. We're getting the redrawing of these cartoons. This is a famous cartoon from 1929 showing four men. You can work out their social class from their hats. And the problem about all stepping down is that the person at the bottom will drown. The difference this time since the crash in 2008 is that the man at the top's actually stepped up. People at the top took more since 2008, and everybody else stepped down. I don't think that you can send the majority of your young women and well over a third of young men to universities. I don't think you can educate them better at schools, which we've certainly done, and fool them all. I really don't think this is going to be possible. 
There have been enormous improvements in society. I haven't talked about those. A huge increase in tolerance, tolerance to people of different sexual identities, a huge drop in racism. I can remember when the police were incredibly racist in the 1970s when I was growing up. Um, I can go on and on about things that, that are much better than they used to be and we tend not to as social scientists and perhaps we should talk a bit more about things which have got better. Or we could look at where things are far worse, which is in the United States, where in some of the poorest neighbourhoods of the United States, one in every 17 women is being evicted a year from where they live um, and put out literally onto the street with their children and their belongings. It's a quite horrendous situation in the US. It isn't a situation you would want to get to here. These figures come from Matthew Desmond's book called Evicted. We know that having very small savings, having a bit of security has a huge effect on people, whereas having an enormous amount of money does not make people happier. Uh, one advantage of living in Britain is we have the London Divorce Courts. And one nice thing about the London Divorce Courts is you get to know in detail the lives of the extremely rich. Admittedly, the extremely rich and unhappy. Um, but really, you just have to read some of the, the, the papers that come out to see. Um, you can go to Mayfair or Kensington. People are not walking around with a permanent smile on their faces. In fact, the more I do this, people are more likely to be smiling in parts of Britain with less money than parts of Britain with most money. I live in Oxford now. I go up to Summertown, I sometimes sit on the bench and I watch people in one of the richest parts of my city who are quite thin, I think they have to be thin, scurrying around. We've got the Farrell and Ball paint shop up in Summertown. Um, working out what they buy, and I don't see happiness. Whereas I go to Templar Square, which is a new name for the Cowley Centre, shopping centre, and people are smiling more there. Not a very objective measure, I think we'd be interesting to look at it. But just go to the most affluent part of Cardiff and look at people's faces, and then go to an average part of Cardiff, and just think about it. We have a revolution in terms of the power of women that has been underway for a long time and isn't recognised because people are very angry about what is still happening to women. But if you want one thing, which as far as I can see is very closely connected, the amazing drop in violence in the world and in our society is connected by women bringing up their children with much more power than mothers in previous generations were able to. I can, I've put it in simply as examples of things that are getting better. I'm not quite sure. We're going to get two women, by the way, I learnt about an hour ago. Yeah. So we'll see. There are people, a minority of human beings, and again, there's lots of academic research coming out on this, and I must speed up, who are not pro-social. It's not their fault. They just come like that, and, and they are selfish, and they do not like the way that things are going. They become deeply upset by slights and what they describe as incivility. David Cameron had a war, a war on incivility, thought it was very important to be polite. Um, and they don't like the idea of working class people going to university and they don't like the idea of people coming together because they think that some people are genetically superior to others and they should rule and the rest of you should just know what, where your place is. And you have to beware of people like that. And they think change has gone too far and we should return to the order of our grandfathers and fathers' time. These are slides I've been using for two or three years. And we should get back to Britain being great again and we should become the richest country on the earth and we should again be in a central position in what was our empire. Um, and I think this, in a sense, is, what, is part of what has led to what has happened recently. And this is the kind of sign you see if you live in Oxford. Estate agents like to put this one up when they sell a house. In Oxford, the average house costs 16, 16 times the average salary. Right? In London, it's 15. And they put up a sign saying, too late. Um, there is no alternative, almost. You simply have to accept the market. If you're not a winner, you'll never get a mortgage. No wonder people were annoyed. 
and they want the people who are frightened. I want to read you one thing else and I'll show you half a dozen more slides and I'll stop and you can ask questions. Um, these are some lyrics from a song I first saw when I was a child and they've gone through my head last two months. Um, if you're my age or older, you'll recognise them. If you're younger, you probably won't. Uh, but it's a folk song which was popular in Germany and became particular po particularly popular in the 1930s. I can't sing, so I have to read them out. The sun on the meadow is summery warm. The stag in the forest runs free. But gather together to greet the storm. Tomorrow belongs to me. The branch of the linden is leafy and green. The vine gives its gold to the sea. But somewhere a glory awaits unseen. Tomorrow belongs to me. The babe in his cradle is closing his eyes. The blossom embraces the bee. But soon, says a whisper, arise, arise. Tomorrow belongs to me. O oh, fatherland, fatherland, show us the sign. Your children have waited to see. The morning will come when the world is mine. Tomorrow belongs to me. In the 1930s in Germany, inequality had been rising rapidly. Destitution had been increasing, eviction had been increasing. And that was the song sung by the Hitler Youth, that Germany could be great again. They could take back their country. I do think we have to worry about the place we have now found ourselves in, partly because of some of the people who are leading the campaign and what they have been involved in in the past. Not the politicians, the paid people behind them. We are not swamped. This is a map of Europe, data from 2014, showing in each area, each region of Europe, the proportion of people who were born in another country. And as you get towards the middle of Europe, the map is stretched so the areas where a lot of people are made big. This is Paris, this is Madrid, this is London, this is Switzerland. Absolutely full of people not born in Switzerland. Switzerland couldn't work without people not born in Switzerland. If you look at the UK, you'll see that the bulk of immigration has been to London or to Northern Ireland, two areas that voted to remain. If you look down here, you'll see where our immigrants are, right? who are currently working out whether they can afford private health care in Spain. And the worry is they'll start coming back. <laughs> and the worry is, and the, and the worry is, that those young people that the rest of Europe paid for their education, who learned how to be nurses and doctors somewhere else, are going to start going back. And the bigger worry is that those young people in Europe who were, who were thinking of coming to work in a care home or in a hospital, would you come now? So how are you going to staff GP surgeries in the valleys? That's, that's the worry. This little boy is called Mohammed. This picture was taken not very long ago, March this year, by students on a geography field trip from the University of Sheffield. The students had taken superhero capes over, so he's wearing his superhero cape, and he's got some face paint on, which is why Mohammed is very happy. Um, and he's in a refugee camp, Moya refugee camp on the island of Lesbos. And he's what we're scared of him and his family. And I think it's time we began to recognise part of, of what has actually happened and is happening. Uh, if you want an example to look at, we'll have the 75th anniversary next year of the Kinder Transport Children. The group of children in the world most likely to become Nobel Peace Prize, Peace Prize winners. Absolutely it's shocking how, what happened to the Kinder Transport Children, how well they did. We are not going to rebuild the British Empire. But now at least we're going to find out whether that's true or not. Yep, we're not going to rebuild it. We'll find out now whether we will. We've got to send stopping our ships to Mytilene to stop boys like Mohammed in rafts. Absolutely shameful and stupid. And what's that ship actually going to do? This is the Chancellor of my university and his daughters a few years ago in Hong Kong. And the tears being shed about the terrible loss of another last part of empire. It is very hard giving up being one of the most powerful countries in the world. 
When I was a child, you could go to France and get 10 francs for a pound. And then I can remember it was 3 francs to the pound. And very, very soon, it'll be 1 euro to the pound. So that's where we're moving. We could get 10 francs to the pound when I was a child, not because we were brilliant industrialists or brilliant innovators, but because we had had an empire. And we never understood that it was the empire that made it as rich. We thought it was our own ingenuity, because that's what our school textbooks told us. And I think part of what's going on is this realisation that that is the case and we are going to become a normal country. The question is how we're going to become a normal country and what kind of a normal country we're going to become. Because there is a huge range of choices just within Europe between being one kind of country and another kind of country. I've tried to be generous, but it's not that easy to be generous at the moment. I do have hope, and I can tell you why in questions. I try to use humour, but it's hard to use humour at the moment if you're talking about the biggest health crisis the country has had since the war and the most shocking electoral result, probably again since the war. But I do think we need to be kind in what we do. I do think we need to understand, try to understand people. We are not a country full of races. Wales is actually completely average. Of all the countries and regions of the United Kingdom, not one was a spot on to the national UK average vote as Wales. And it's just simple things like this um, before you think that things have, have looked in a different way that need to be done. People do want to take back their countries. People do want their children to be able to afford a home and start a family and live with some kind of security. The problem is they've been told that the reason they couldn't do that was immigrants. And we're about to find out that that wasn't the reason why they couldn't do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, really stimulating and full uh, presentation, Danny. Um, we've got about half an hour now for, for questions and discussion. I must say that the um, Tomorrow Belongs to Me um, song um, was one of the most chilling elements of the film Cabaret. I don't know how many of you remember that great film, Cabaret, um, when the young Nazis stand up and sing that song. Um, so it was very interesting to hear you using that. Very interesting too to hear someone who's known for his quantitative work talk about the importance of sitting in some of our streets and looking at what, what is happening and how people are there. And I think uh, that's an important uh, reminder of the different ways in which we can use our understanding of our world uh, in different ways. So, um, we've got about half an hour. I'm simply going to um, allow people to, uh, to say what they need to say. I'd be grateful if people would do two things. One is to say who they are when they ask a question. And secondly, not to give political speeches, but to ask <laughs> questions that other people can then come in on. Okay? So, it's open to you. Um, you, you talked about... Just say who you are. I'm oh, sorry, G. Leslie. You talked about uh, the crisis facing the health service. You talked about austerity. <coughs> so, do you not think that a lot of what has happened with regard to care being withdrawn, everything else collapsing, is due to this mistaken belief that austerity was necessary in the light of the financial crash. Yet, back in the 1930s, when a similar thing befell Europe, the USA, under Roosevelt, spent their way out of the crisis. They used the more Keynesian kind of economics. They did the exact opposite policy. Do you, so do you think it's necessary for an understanding that the policies are wholly incorrect and mistaken for this disaster to you know, be uh, reversed. And, you also, and the second point, with regard to you talking about 
the importance of a very, you know, a limited uh, degree of being able to increase one's savings. Few people seem to be aware, would you not agree, of the disastrous continuation of support of the banks by funding for lending, which means they no longer need anybody's savings. That's why there are no interest rates for savings, and yet all political parties seem to support this. Yeah. What's your feeling on this? Okay, on those two, um, we, we've been reducing our health spending for decades. So we got to a point last year uh, where uh, apart from Greece only after the crisis and Italy after the crisis, we are spending less per head on health than anywhere else in Western Europe. Uh, if we wanted to spend the same amount that they spend in Germany, we'd have to spend 1,050 million more a week. That's 1 billion more a week to, to fund health at the level of Germany. France is 27% higher. Um, so we've been very... We've been, yeah, we've been very, very bad health spending. We certainly could, after 2010, have, have had a very different policy and we need not to have had the austerity we had. However, now where we are, I suspect we are going to have to have austerity uh, because we've just spent billions and billions of, current, of other currency trying to keep the pound up. You can't hold the pound up by spending pounds. Um, so the country is rapidly bankrupting itself at the moment. And I, we are going to be rapidly poorer, and it is our own fault. That is, that is what is currently happening. The housing market is the one to watch. London, you never know, may be propped up by some foolish overseas buyers. And the problem is they're not foolish if enough of them pile in, as long as they sell quickly. Um, but the rest of the country is going to see a house price crash. And that then has terrible results. So I, I would agree with you, the problem is that where we are now, it may be much more difficult. We may have to now cut our cloth and accept a lower standard of living. Um, on the banks and lending, the most amazing thing is that every budget that George Osborne did from 2010 onwards, he spent more money on helping the banks lend people money to get housing and landlords to get housing than anything else. Uh, Osborne spent more in budgets on housing and helping banks lend than anything else. It got to the ridiculous point last year where if I wanted to buy a house in London costing £590,000, if I could find a 5% deposit, you would give me a 40% mortgage. The government had been giving people 40% mortgages in London um, because the banks wouldn't. On the premise that Osborne said house prices can't fall. And there you about to. Um, Barclays shares were suspended. It's, the banks are allowed to make money out of nothing, but they cannot simply exist um, without some kind of veneer of credibility. And things have been tricky, but at the moment there are Italian banks that may be going under because of what's happened. It's not safe. We're not living in a safe world and a safe uh, system. Sorry, scotching the, the funding. Yeah, sorry, you've had, you've had a question. Yeah. Carl. Uh, thank you for a very stimulating um, uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Carl Plus, uh, non executive director with Public Health Wales, mm. with a particular interest in uh, community development uh, in a very deprived rural area mm. over many years now. Uh, I believe I'm right to say, perhaps somebody could correct me, but the, the percentage in Wales in favour of remaining within the EU, going back some six months, was something like 17% in, 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 in favour. Uh, the, the actual referendum result, of course, you referred to. But there again, there was a YouGov poll this very week, which showed that the referendum result, in fact, had, had, had switched, had reversed mm. to percentages being you know, on the other side. Yeah. So we're clearly in a very labile uh, situation. I'm just wondering, would you like to predict uh, where this is going next? I mean, how trans it was clearly a, a snapshot mm. vote on the day. Yeah. Where's the balance going to land at the end yeah. of the day and what implications that might have? Oh, right. the, the only accurate poll there's been is Lord Ashcroft's poll taken as people left from voting. At least a tenth of people literally did decide in the ballot box what to do. And what's interesting is they tick, they tick the anything but this option at last minute. Our polling firms are not completely useless and stupid. And certainly the money markets have a huge incentive to try to predict it right and didn't. It was unpredictable and people did switch. 
Uh, I think general election. I, I think we're heading towards a general election in which the parties will make clear their position and in a sense we will be voting on this again but not in a referendum in a general election and it all depends how quickly uh, that comes and it all depends to what extent our ragbag set of parties on the left and green can organise themselves better than they've managed for the last 20 years. I'm not particularly worried about the split within the Labour Party, I'm not a member of any political party. I'm much more worried about the split between Labour and the Liberals, between Labour and the Greens, between Plaid and Labour. And if you give people four or five candidates like that versus one UKIP candidate and one Conservative candidate, UKIP and the Conservatives will be winning very well. And it's time for people on the progressive side of politics to grow up. And in first past the post, it's time for them to work out how to put up a single candidate in the Westminster constituency on a remit of PR and of not enacting Article 50. Um, that can be organised locally. I don't think it's going to be organised from London. And I don't. I'm an optimist, but I would be amazed to watch it well organised locally. Um, but Oxford West and Amidon, we are trying. Thank you. Yes. Ron Morton, Forum. I think that a lot of what you said is very attractive and uh, to a lot of people. Um, but how would you respond to um, the accusation that really, as a nation, we have become too soft, uh, we become too dependent on people looking after us? Um, uh, what we need is a bit more done. We need some where people actually stand up, they become more resilient. Uh, the health service uh, uh, is continually making pill, people ill by prescribe, over prescribing, um, the, uh, <coughs> not looking after their own health, um, and expecting everything to be done for them. So, um, really, um, people need to have a bit more, you know, boom and stand up for it yeah. and, and get on with it, rather than uh, moan and so on. And this is the kind of spirit that um, made us great in the late 19th century. I mean, there was murder, you know, a little village of a few thousand in the space of uh, 15, 20 years, uh, a place with 50,000 people working. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting, Murtha, just over 100 years ago, the most popular place for immigration in the world was California with gold rushes and the second most popular was the Welsh Valleys. So what made Murtha and the rest of the valleys work were huge numbers of Russian and Polish and other immigrants uh, who came to, to work down uh, mines. Uh, we are Darwinian. We've gone Darwinian. That's why 12% rise in our over 90s mortality has happened. 9% rise in 85s. Uh, nowhere else in Western Europe leaves people alone so much to struggle for themselves. Nowhere else gives the bottom 20% of society so little. Nowhere else has benefits that are so low. So we are the Darwinian experiment. It was reported today in the newspapers that somebody was found having died four hours late, you know, earlier in an accident in the emergency. Large numbers of people die in their flats and are found months later. We are the Darwinian experiment of Western Europe uh, and the result is not good. We didn't become an empire because we were particularly Darwinian. Uh, we became an empire because we were in the right place at the right time. The empire before us was the United Provinces uh, centred around what is now Amsterdam. Um, and in effect, we took over from them and the United States took over from us. And the interesting parallel, if you look at the United Provinces, is that house prices peaked in real terms in Amsterdam around about 1673 and then fell for 250 years. Um, people do better when they work co cooperatively and together. That's how we got a National Health Service. That's how we improved our living standards. That's how we got infant mortality down. When you tell people to battle it out against each other, as they do in the United States, you get the highest infant mortality in the rich world, the lowest life expectancy, uh, the greatest taking of antidepressants and, and pills. Whereas when you collaborate with others and you respect other people, you do better because 
we are remarkably similar to each other. There are not some people who are super able and we have to have some kind of fight where they rise to the top and we can see their super able ability. Margaret Thatcher used to talk about tall poppies and said that the British didn't allow the tall poppies to grow to do well. Well, since 1979, we had an experiment of what happens if you let the tall poppies grow and do well and take more and see whether it trickles down and helps everybody else. And we've done this experiment, if you like, for the benefit of the rest of the world to show them what happens if you, if you do that. And the result has not been good. Yes. Electoral reform, yes. I think most people would probably <coughs> need that. We do not have representative government. And that's why most of the time it's just not worth voting. And I always reach the point of saying to people, I used to say, people die to give you the vote, you must use your vote. I'm not sure I want to say that. Mm. It does seem so pointless that it might be better to do a sound and see if we have a 10% turnout now. Getting away from that, Policies we adopt often represent the underlying attitudes that we have. And I'd be interested in your comments on how far that's fueled by, one, the culture of celebrity, two, the role of private education and all that flows from it, and three, a particularly pernicious right wing press. Okay, those three things. Uh, the culture of celebrity has risen. Um, it's higher in English speaking countries because we're more affected by international media. Uh, there are these odd things. Countries which have their own language uh, are more immune to worldwide trends like this. Um, so one example would be the US spends 4% of its GDP on advertising. We spend two, the rest of Europe spends one. And it's, I think, similar with the, the effects of celebrities uh, on us. Your second point, because my memory's not great, Celebrity and private education. Oh, private education. P a private education was a hangover of empire. Uh, what people in this country often don't realise is there's only other, one other country in the OECD that spends as much on private education as that's Chile. Uh, in most of mainland Europe, there is hardly any private education. The people simply use local state education. There's still differences and hierarchies and inequalities, but an apartheid system where we separate our children is highly, highly unusual. The difference in, in the amount we fund per head between private and state is very similar to the amount that Nelson Mandela complained about when he was uh, in court and explaining why he engaged in the acts he did just before the judge decided whether to kill him or not. He was complaining that black children had six times less spent on their education than white children. That is the situation we have in Britain. We've cut the spending on state six forms. 16 and 17 year olds in this country have less spent on their education than any, you know, France, Germany and anywhere. Because of these divides, it's a, it's a hangover from empire. We can only afford it because of the inequalities in income. You couldn't have this private education divide without that. Uh, Oxford is twinned with the city of Bonn. And in the city of Bonn, uh, it's very hard to get teachers to tell you about the differences between the schools. And the schools are all private, sorry, all state, apart from one. There's one very expensive private school uh, for the somewhat slow boys of the upper, upper classes of Europe, which they laugh about in Bonn. And they particularly laugh about its most famous pupil, who was our Prince Philip. Um, <laughs> and can you imagine getting to that point where Eton and Harrow were somewhere where you'd send somebody who was finding it difficult. Um, and maybe we will. I mean, how's this going to affect the, <laughs> the reputation of Eton? <laughs> really? Um, your third point, because of my terrible memory? Press. The press. Uh, we're not the, uh, there is a relationship between press and inequality. So the US has Fox News. Italy mucks it up on our graphs because Italy has a terribly controlled press but manages not to behave quite so badly. Um, the press had an effect. Rupert Murdoch is ecstatic at the moment. It need not always be like this, but you have to control your press. And at the moment, you have to defend uh, having a BBC, but you also have to ask the BBC 
was its particular policy on neutrality, the way it interpreted it, there was only one economist on the leave side, Patrick. You know, do you really have to put Patrick up as much, Patrick Minford, up as much as all the other ones combined? Can you imagine putting all the climate change scientists who tell you you've got a problem up for the same amount of time as some oddball who <laughs> decides that he thinks the planet's fine, right? But the BBC did go for that policy, and they went for that policy because they were afraid of being privatised um, by the current government. We have ended up in an in a incredible situation because of something which was slowly getting worse since the late 1970s. And I think you're seeing the, the end of that, and things can change very, very quickly now. Um, but it's not possible to predict in which way they are going to change, except I would be shocked if in five years' time we're like we are now. We are either going to be more to the right or more to the left, but we're not going to be in a similar position as we are today. Um, I thought more changed after the financial crash in 2008 than in the whole period I'd studied before. 25 years of studying social science, more changed. I spent years studying the North-South divide, arguing with politicians about had it become slightly wider or slightly narrower. All that work was pointless after 2008. The divide became a chasm. The house price gap became £10,000 higher. And I thought that would be the biggest shock I would see. And now we're about to get another one. And it does feel a little bit like 100 years ago. And if you want to be optimistic, 100 years ago is when we were last most unequal and when inequalities began to fall and the rich lost their wealth. Nobody celebrated for about 30 years. We became more equal in the 1920s and the 1930s. There was a landslide election in 1945. By the 1960s and early 1970s, we were the most equal country in Europe apart from Sweden, um, having gone for the most class-ridden. And if you want to be optimistic about this, this is the kind of thing that gets that kind of change, and it's much, much better than a war or two wars. Yeah. Thank you. Julian. Uh, um, Julian Hart, uh, with GP. Uh, um, what you're calling for, really, I mean, the implication mm -hmm. is we need new, different kinds of society altogether mm. to fit with what we already are, mm. or are trying to be. Uh, uh, a new society doesn't ever emerge uh, de novo. It, it is always latent within mm. its preceding society. So I think we have a number of institutions that are inherently uh, democratizing, uh, equalizing, and you know, egalitarian and so on. Uh, the obvious one is the National Health Service, and that's the reason that we keep talking about it all the time, everybody. Mm. Uh, and as you say, people's concerned about their health, but that's the first thing they talk about. But uh, there are other things, uh, particularly the information revolution, uh, although it's got all sorts of ghastly potential, uh, it's tending to uh, create a kind of gift economy within itself. It, it's, and people, uh, well, people like me, so <coughs> to learn how to cope with one uh, computer language, will be uh, our longing for an end to progress so that we can <laughs> incessant change. Uh, and uh, we're, we're prompted just by planned obsolescence and you know, yeah. have to buy a new one. Uh, so all of those things, there are things that are trying to get us somehow to have a more rational economy yeah. where, for example, we would stop saying uh, that if I go to, to work in Glencoru for coal miners' families and then later on for unemployed families uh, or steel workers' families, uh, then I am a sort of parasite on the economy, 
and I don't create wealth, so I consume it. Mm. Uh, everything's paid for by taxes. Uh, whereas, if I had gone to work in uh, the street of shame, uh, Carly Street, uh, and advertise myself yeah. to whoever will come, uh, and believe in whatever healthcare system is most profitable. Yeah, you would have been a private entrepreneur. I am a wealth producer. Yeah. <laughs> that is no. ridiculous. But that is what, uh, if you do something that can be traded, yeah. uh, but yeah. the most wonderful example is child rearing. Mm -hmm. We are seeing that the difficulties of child rearing now, because there's nobody left to do it, mm. because everybody's out slaving away in a bloody, uh, yeah. what do you call it, coal or something like that. Uh, these things are producing wealth. That's really what you've been saying all the time. Yeah. Now, how do you organize this? You, well, an alternative economy? Yeah, me, me, and, me and you don't. Yeah, I, th I think we don't. I'm minded. My, my granddad was born in 1916, so he saw the general strike in 26, uh, and then he was sent to war in 1939. And his generation, and it was largely men with a few women, uh, saw the banks crash, saw themselves sent to war when their parents had had a world war, and didn't trust them. And when they returned in 1945, they took seats and they changed society. It was already changing, but they solidified it and, and got us schools that everybody could go to, um, ensured that we got the health service, made it better, got benefits, made sure that you weren't impoverished if you were a mum on your own with kids. It's going to be the equivalent of his generation again. Um, it's it's going to be majority of people under 50 voted to stay, um, of those who voted. That generation who we've given so little to, apart from an education, which they might, might not be very happy with what they got, it's, it's that generation. Every year that generation goes by another year. And every year ours will actually shrink. Um, and I, I think simply saying to a generation that's younger, we didn't set this up well uh, for you, but at least we didn't send you to war apart from that man who was in the news last few days <laughs> today. And good news, you know, to end up with a conclusion that says never again to that. There are lots and lots and lots of good news stories uh, coming out at the moment. But I think there needs to be an admission from people of my age and older that we, we actually did fail. Um, and I think it'll become clear over the next few months when the pound doesn't soar and the entrepreneurs don't rush in, and all our former colonies don't come begging to the foreign office for special deals with us. Um, but it's not gonna be nice. It's gonna, you know, and, and a lot of people will never accept that it was a bad idea. And they'll say, well, we could have become the richest country in the world again. It was your fault for talking it down to people like me. I'm fully aware of that. It's just that uh, I'm not stupid. <laughs> Yeah, if you could say who you are. Uh, Adam Jones, Public Health Practitioner for Policy in Public Health Wales. For my 30 years, the majority of bad things have been blamed on Europe or the mad bureaucrats in Europe. Is the one positive from all of this, the fact that we're now not in Europe, people will start to realise the failures of domestic policy more? Yeah. Uh, or am I being too optimistic? No, and, and, and the biggest one for me is that for every general election since at least 1990, seven, I think, 92, immigration has quietly been the most salient issue. In 2010, the economy just managed to beat it to second place. But we have had a racist undercurrent of our voting for a very long time. We're about to get net emigration. P more people will be going and not coming than coming in. And at the very least, it'll it'll stop the blame on people coming. We're going to have to work out how to keep care homes going. We're going to have to work out how to pick fruit in the fields. That, that, that's going to need to be done. Uh, I'm also positive, because I am an optimistic person, that without us constantly stopping Brussels, regulating bankers, making other things better, 
I do think that the core of Europe has a chance to do something which we stopped it doing endlessly. Um, and I do wonder, I do wonder whether at some point we will have to rejoin and we will rejoin with no special concessions because we've lost them. Um, that may be a long time away, um, but I really don't think we're going to become this tax haven, offshore, dodgy place for casino money. Um, I mean, the immediate thing that's going to happen is the food prices are about to rise because the pound's dropped. Then the petrol prices rise. Then the houses begin to fall in value, which means that the faster you sell your house as an older person, the more money you can give to your children. Because if you hang on into your house as the price of it goes down, you're losing money. So this could free up housing for families because it makes sense to move out of the family home into family homes is falling in, in value. Foreign holidays have to reduce. There'll be more camping. Uh, car driving has to reduce because the pri more camping, more glamping. <laughs> All you've got to do is put some pretty stuff on a tent and you can call it glamping. Um, we'll, we'll get a reduction in driving, we'll get more cycling. Uh, our carbon footprint's about to go down dramatically. <coughs> You know, it's not all necessarily bad. We're going to get more overseas students from outside the EU because suddenly the fees of this university, if you come from China, have dropped by a quarter. Um, that's our major export industry, by the way. It's education. <laughs> when I was in Sheffield, we calculated that the income that the two universities in Sheffield made from overseas students, uh, including the money we made from graduation from them, from China and Malaysia, was more than the profits of the entire metalworking industry of South Yorkshire, which is mainly an arms industry. Um, um, uh, a lot of the rest of our manufacturing, certainly what will happen in Port Talbot, but also Oxford. Oxford does, produces 1% of our manufactured goods. Anybody know what it is? It's the Mini. And so, so in theory, the Mini's got cheaper. Does it help us? No, because BMW own it. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> at least we own our university still. Uh, the big fear in Oxford is that the 1,100 robots that largely make the cars all fit inside a lorry and can be moved to Germany. Uh, there are only 3,000 people, still mostly men, working in the plant in Oxford. There were 30,000 when I was a boy growing up in Oxford. Half of the 3,000 men who are working on what's left of the line in Oxford are Eastern European. So BMW are in Oxford for the name Oxford and for the labour that comes from the rest of Europe. And there's a whole set of things about to fold out, which is why you require solidarity, because it's going to get frightening. And when people get frightened, then they can behave in particular ways. Um, and they'll carry on holding to their beliefs that the last immigrant is not in their area, that it's the immigrants. The, the vote to leave correlated perfectly with where the fewest immigrants were. People were strongest about the problem with the immigrants. Um. Thanks very much, Danny. I think I'm going to finish the questions there and ask Ian to come and say a few words. Ian's the director of music, which is one of the sponsors of this event, along with Public Health Wales and the School of Social Sciences. I should have said that at the beginning. Um, so over to you, Ian. Thanks, Gareth. Um, so uh, on behalf of Public Health Wales, uh, the School of Social Sciences at Cardiff University and uh, WIZARD, and everyone here, I should say, uh, let me extend a very hearty vote of thanks to Dan for this fantastic presentation. I've known Danny for over 20 years and he never fails to deliver uh, and he's given us some very important insights uh, this evening. Um, just a, a, a note, I'm a bit of a pedant, I think the uh, German soldiers in the 30s sang the horse vessel, so Gareth is right, uh, tomorrow belongs to me, he comes from Cabaret, and I can't remember the, the names of the composers but they got fed up, because it was written in the 60s, they got terribly fed up with letters from neo-Nazis saying what a wonderful 
song they'd found. Um, uh, so just a bit of history there. I hope I'm right with that one. Um, I'm a sociologist. There's a tendency in sociology to be uh, a bit nihilistic. Um, reading too much Nietzsche, I think, that's what does it. Um, so I was speaking to Julian uh, just before we went in, and uh, he can't, I was a bit depressed, as usual, about the vote and things, and Julian corrected me and said, it's time to be an optimist. And um, what surprised me, it wasn't one of these cliches about Gramsci, about uh, you know, pessimism of the intellect. Um, Julian said, it's time to be an optimist, because if you're an optimist, it forces you to look for the evidence. I think that's right. You can correct me. I will ask you if you're an optimist after listening to Danny <laughs> talk. But I think that was incredibly uh, um, uh, useful to hear him say that. Because what Danny does so well is he marshals the evidence as a public intellectual and makes us think about incredibly important issues. And I was very, I mean, pleased is not the right word, but Danny's done some important work in the BMJ recently showing the fall in life expectancy amongst women in this country. It is shocking that we're in this situation. Um, and I'm going to say something depressing now because I think there is a link between that and the choice this Westminster government has made to cut social care. Um, Many of these women have dementia, um, have died from pneumonia or other causes, um, but the root cause is the cuts to services. What's worrying for me is as someone who's uh, fought for increasing spending on the NHS for many decades now, is that work we've been doing at Wizard on social care shows clearly that social care in this country is increasingly being delivered by private equity companies. More than 20% of social care is now in the hands of private equity firms. Their usual model is to split the company. They have a property company and they have an operational company. These companies are in complex systems of offshore companies linked together. There is usually a, what's called the fair price that's agreed with the government. The fair price is roughly around 11% at the moment. That is their profit. Yes, I know. That is their profit before their offshore companies charge management fees. Now, the depressing thing for me, and as Danny has shown in many books now, we have increasing inequality in this country, is we need to think about the mechanisms for these inequalities. These same companies are asking for the government to spend more money on social care. I also want the government to spend more money on social care. But the evidence is stacking up that as the government spends more money on social care, more money goes to the Cayman Islands, to Jersey, to other offshore companies that this government, as Danny pointed out, has done much to protect by its dealings in Europe. So I think there are huge issues that Danny's evidence raises, and we need, um, and, it, and it presents us with contradictions in terms of politics. But one thing I think is clear from his most recent book is that we can't be nihilistic. Politics is about choices. It was a clear choice to cut social care. If we had gone a different way, there are different ways of living and delivering. So I, I thank Danny very much for his inspirational talk this evening. I'd also like to take the opportunity to say some thanks to uh, Susan, Thomas, Christine Burns and Debbie from uh, um, Public Health Wales and <coughs> events in Soxai for actually doing the hard work, uh, the hard logistical work and support for making this event possible. Um, 
I'd also like to say that uh, next, we are going to carry on. So next year, um, the uh, 11th, is it the 11th? Next year, the 11th Julian Tudor Hart annual lecture will be held in November in this building. Uh, and I'm delighted to say that the speaker will be Sir Michael Marmot. Uh, we don't know what he's going to talk about yet, but I hope to see you uh, all there at that event. So, um, just to say once again, thanks to Gareth for chairing, uh, to everyone for coming, and once again to say how grateful we are to Danny for making this such a memorable occasion. Thank you very much.